Good afternoon, everyone. I am Lisa Lanzalotti. I'm the Marketing Manager at Mossy Bioservices, and I'd like to welcome you to our Warehouse Map webinar. Uh, before we start, go through a couple of things here. You'll see in your control panel, on probably on the right side of your screen, there um, is a panel for questions where you can type in anything for our and we'll answer those at the end of the presentation. You'll also notice that there is a section uh, for handouts. That's where you'll find uh, a copy of the presentation that you can download, as well as um, some reference material. So that said, I'm gonna hand it off to Rob Brace, and he will begin the presentation. All right, great. Thanks, Lisa. Can everybody hear me? Can you hear me, Lisa? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so welcome. Uh, this is the Warehouse Mapping Best Practices webinar. And today's panelists, we're going to introduce each other here uh, as we go along. So I am Rob Briggs. I'm the Validation Business Development Manager. Mike, would you introduce yourself? Mike Hansford, Project Lead. Lauren? I'm Lauren Peppers. I'm the validation manager here in the MAPS office. Hi, everyone. Sylvan? Oh, thanks, Rob. Hi, I'm Sylvan Polk. I'm the director of validation for the Pennsylvania office for Massey. Okay, great. All right, so today we'll be talking about warehouse mapping best practices. Um, whether large or small, each place that stores temperature sensitive product should be mapped. Um, some regulations that suggest uh, storage of product and uh, controlled temperature environments off the top of my head there's uh, 21 CFR 820 which is for medical devices there's 21 CFR um, 211 for drug product there's even uh, ICHQ7A and that's for API or uh, active pharmaceutical ingredients um, so when we are approaching a mapping uh, of a warehouse what you see here on the screen are uh, four of the major steps that we go through uh, to be able to get from creating a plan to actually providing results. And what we're going to do during this presentation, we'll break it down a little bit more for you. Um, and you'll see that on the coming slide. So here we go. All right, so creating a plan. So inside of each one of these, we've kind of broken these down a little bit more too, uh, to make them a little bit more easily digestible. Uh, so on this slide, we'll talk about assessing the storage envelope. Uh, study length, uh, seasonal mapping, and experience in sensors. So uh, let's start off with uh, assessing the storage envelope. So some things to consider are certainly the storage area itself, um, any sort of specifications related to temperature and humidity, uh, corners, uh, air intakes, exhausts, doors, windows, lights, uh, product storage height, um, Sylvan, uh, would you be able to jump in here and uh, tell us what else we might be looking for? Uh, sure, Rob. Um, really, you're looking, there's two main elements that are going to drive uh, the validation plan um, when you're assessing the storage envelope. Uh, the two things you're looking at are the actual storage requirements for the material or the product that's being stored. Uh, what is the acceptable temperature and or humidity range? What are the conditions that you need? And the second thing would be anything that might impact those conditions. So if you're uh, looking at temperature and also possibly humidity, um, what are the things that might actually affect uh, the uh, operating range or that, you know, the range that you want to control that condition toward? Um, and just to expand a little bit on the items you mentioned there, um, you're going to want to look at where the material is actually being stored, where it's not being stored or where it's not planned for, you know, areas that aren't planned for storage. Um, this will determine, you know, where we're going to place mapping sensors uh, for qualification. Uh, we're going to look at the HVAC system that actually controls the temperature and or the humidity and look at the discharge and the return points, especially relative to where the material storage uh, locations are. Um, the arrangement, the height, the density of the racking, looking at how close to the walls the racking is positioned. Um, those walls can often be warmer or colder than the air uh, in the space that's being controlled. Any structures that can impede airflow, uh, when you're looking at a warehouse, it's very dependent on the moving air to actually uh, maintain uh, the temperature and the humidity conditions. So anything that blocks that airflow is actually 
uh, it had, there's a potential that it could create uh, hotter cold spots. Um, and then other things that can affect temperature, like lights, windows, uh, sunlight, if it comes in as a heat source, um, and kind of the things you mentioned, the entry and the egress points, doors, air leaks in or out. And then if there's any adjacent storage areas, uh, like on the other side of a wall, a shared wall, if your warehouse is maintained at one temperature and you've got a wall to another area that's maintained at a different temperature, that could certainly impact uh, the temperature in the space that you're qualifying. So those are a few things. Okay, great. No, thank you, Sylvan. Um, second bullet point we have here is on uh, study length. So Mike Hansford, on uh, study length, what, what's the typical duration and then what, uh, what duration provides the best mapping? Uh, most favorable is seven days. That's what we see mostly. You can go a shorter three days. Uh, people like to do that on a weekend just to get a good sense of what their uh, storage capacity can do with no activity going on. We, we very rarely do something like that. Normally it's the seven, 10 or 14 days. And that gives them a good uh, downtime for weekend study as well as the activity going on inside that warehouse. So it's affected by everything that goes on during the, the work week. Okay, great, thank you. So Lauren, we've heard a lot about seasonal mapping. Uh, when is this needed and why? <laughs> Uh, yeah, during the initial commission of the warehouse, you'd want to perform your seasonal mapping during the next two seasons. Uh, and then anytime that you do a requalification, uh, you would want to requal your warehouse at the desired frequency that your organization, organization has determined, which I know will be at a later slide anyways. Uh, and why is it needed? Uh, well, the warehouse often has um, outer facing walls to the outside um, because there isn't as much insulation between the storage area and the weather extremes, depending on where you are. Um, you want to get both the summer and winter uh, mappings. Uh, so if you're operating your warehouse at like 20 C, uh, obviously your seasonal extremes in the winter, which can go down to negative 20, negative 40 C, depending on where you are, especially with wind chills, um, or in during the summer, all the way up to 40 C, uh, obviously depending on where you are. And you really want to capture both extremes and see how they affect the temperature inside the warehouse. Perfect, all right, great. Hey, uh, Sylvan, on, on the last one here, uh, experience in sensors. Um, so what's important on having uh, the correct sensors with the correct tolerances to map the warehouse? And then we'll jump to the second part afterwards if you can answer the first one. Sure. Um, it's really kind of a case of choosing the right tool for the job. That's always important. So if we're talking about mapping a warehouse, we want a system that's gonna work well in that environment. Um, specifically for tolerances, you know, we wanna make sure that the equipment we're using is capable of providing the performance that we need. So, you know, you know, in general, with a large space, we're probably going to be looking at using a wireless portable logger. Uh, it's small, it's unobtrusive, doesn't need to be plugged into a power source. It just makes sense in a larger space to use that type of sensor. Um, and then as far as tolerances are concerned, we want to look at the actual temperature humidity range that we're mapping and make sure that that sensor is capable of providing readings at an accuracy that makes sense for the study conditions and the operating range that we're qualifying against. And of course, we're qualifying that space. We want to make sure those sensors are certified to be accurate, which means they should be calibrated to a NIST traceable standard um, as well. Um, and I think one more thing to mention on the probe type being used is there are a lot of different probes out there. You know, some by design have an internal versus an external probe. And depending on what kind of data you're trying to capture, you want to look at the, the actual physical design of the sensor too, just to make sure it's going to give you the type of readings that you want. Um, the external versus internal probe can sometimes affect how the sensor responds to a change in the condition that it's measuring. So another thing to look yeah, at. Okay. So that's it's like dampening. Dampening. Yep, exactly. Yep. Okay. Um, on published guidance, would you speak to us a little bit about some of the published guidance that's out there? Sylvan? Sure. So um, there are a few places where uh, there's guidance. Um, this is, you know, these aren't regulations per se. Uh, they take the existing regulatory expectations and kind of expand on them and provide additional details. So guidance can be found with what uh, the World Health Organization has published guidance. ISP does as well. Uh, U.S. Pharmacopeia uh, <coughs> does as well. Uh, and there's also a lot of white papers from industry organizations, so uh, including Massey. 
uh, we have a published white paper on warehouse mapping, which can be found on our website. So there's a lot of places to go for that type of information. And really, the determination on what guidance to follow should be based on the specific product storage requirements that you, um, that you have. Okay, great. All right. Um, this, uh, this webinar is interactive today. So one thing we are doing is a poll question. So I think this is the time for the first poll question before we move on. Um, so Amy, could you uh, get that poll question started? And we'll just give everybody a minute just to take a peek at, uh, at the poll question before we move on. Hey, Rob, it looks like we have about 11% right now. We're just going to give them another couple of seconds to answer. Okay. Okay, so right now we have, it looks like 55% um, only after commissioning or um, a significant event, and 36% annually. Okay, all right. Yeah, that's an interesting result. Um, uh, we do see all these uh, answers uh, when talking to clients, <laughs> so it doesn't surprise me at all uh, that that was uh, there. Um, any of the panelists, any comments on that? If not, we can we can move. Move on. Okay, let me make sure that I'm sharing here. Can can you see the presentation? Looks good, Rob. Yes, Rob. Okay. Yes. Okay. Cool. All right, I'm moving on. <laughs> All right. So we talked about uh, creating the plan. So this uh, gets more into the execution of the plan. So in this section, we're going to talk about central layout and distribution. We'll talk about how to get to some of those hard to reach spots, uh, avoiding sensor disruption, and then uh, what we do during the study. So Mike Hansford, um, for sensor layout and distribution, do you want to talk about sensor quantities, programming, labeling of sensors, and sensor placement? Sure, Rob, I can do that. Uh, we like to have a, a perimeter approach. And by that, I mean we start with the corners of your storage uh, areas, and we'll map three planes, top, middle, and bottom. And we'll move into the center and do the same thing map your top, middle, and bottom of the center. And from that, we, we strategically place others throughout your warehouse storage area, top, middle, and bottom planes. Um, if it's a longer rectangular type building, we'll add more down the side. So we'll have three on either side, again, top, middle, and bottom. So it gives us a good perimeter to work with. Uh, and I said that backfilling everything else uh, between that. And we'll label based on the rack design in there, um, and the layout will, will be easy to follow based on what their rack uh, identifiers are and our sensor identifiers. Okay, great. Thanks, Mike. All right, Lauren. Um, how do we get the high spots? If, if there's no, yeah, you know, there's no lift available, how do we reach those high high places? Uh. I mean, first of all, I'm going to point down the fact that ideally you'd want to have a lift <laughs> uh, to get up into those higher racks, and then you can attach the um, sensors with magnets onto the racks. Um, if you don't have a lift, though, uh, there are definitely several ways we can go about that. Uh, we have poles that can extend 40 high that we can attach the sensors to, and then place each pole in each location with uh, usually three sensors on each, two to three sensors. Um, and this is also very useful if there's no magnetic surface to attach the sensors to, um, whether that be the racks themselves, a pole in the middle of the room, or even the walls uh, sometimes can be magnetic. Uh, and then also we can just use ladders, um, can move ladders around the room, climb up the ladders, and then attach the magnets to the surfaces that I mentioned, uh, the sensors to the surfaces that I mentioned, either with magnets or just tie them into place. Uh, we can get pretty creative there. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Um, all right. Avoiding sensor disruption. Sylvan, uh, what should be avoided? Um, yeah, sensors, we want them to work, right? We are going to go through a lot of effort to get them placed, um, and we are running a longer study, so we definitely want to make sure we are collecting that data 
We don't want those sensors to become uh, damaged or dislocated, et cetera. So we really want to make sure we're placing them in places where they're hopefully not going to interfere with personnel movement um, or the movement of equipment inside the space. Uh, a warehouse is typically going to have a lot of activity going on. Uh, we're actually trying to capture that when we map. So again, that kind of points to the choice of equipment, you know, why those small wireless loggers are ideal. Uh, they're unobtrusive and they're out of the way. Um, another thing to keep in mind is where you're placing them. You know, the, the top of a pallet, for example, might seem like a great place to put a sensor, but if that pallet gets moved, uh, you're not collecting data where you, you should have anymore. Uh, you, you have, and you might not be able to find your sensor either. So that's obviously a, not a desirable you know, thing to have happen. So making sure the sensors are all placed in good locations where they won't be disturbed, uh, where they won't interfere with the normal activity in the space is important. And another thing too is I, I always wanna make sure that I know my system is working before that study starts or when it starts. So um, you're gonna invest a lot of time into running a mapping study in a warehouse. It's a very good idea to turn everything on, make sure that those loggers are connecting to the base station, making sure that uh, if you're relying on those real-time readings that you don't have something potentially interfering with your RF signal, et cetera. So just you know, doing a quick uh, setup and startup on the system and making sure that it works is always uh, well worth the, the time so that when you are running your study, you know that you have your data being collected. Excellent. So what do you do in the, in the case where, say, like what you can see on the screen there um, for the picture, where there's uh, our sensor is maybe the same color as the, uh, as the racking? What would you do there to call attention to the sensor, Sylvan? Well, that particular picture is interesting because if you look at the orange horizontal beam there, you know, the pallet uh, rack, it is a very similar color to the sensor. If we position that sensor on, on something of that color, it might be very hard to see. So I think there's really kind of one or two, one or two strategies that could be employed. One is to make it so that it's, you know, kind of hidden and out of the way and not visible um, so that hopefully it gets left alone. But the other thing is to make it very visible so that um, it, it's uh, obvious to any operators and it's also easy to retrieve at the end of the study. Um, Sometimes if you look at that racking, you know, it might seem like a great idea to pop that sensor in behind the rack or inside the hollow part of it in the back. Um, it's definitely out of the way if you do that or going onto the cross beams uh, that, that run from the front of the rack to the back. You know, a lot, of, a lot of good places to put them where they're out of the way, but then you also want to be able to find them uh, when your study's finished. So uh, just keeping that in mind, uh, using a high contrast color difference helps. And if that doesn't work, if you're looking at orange racks and you happen to have orange sensors like the one pictured, uh, tying a ribbon of a different color on there, do, you know, using something like that can be helpful too. That's good, terrific, great, great answer. Um, Mike, during the study, I know someone kind of touched upon it with, uh, with uh, the benefit of real time, but let me ask you that too. What, what is the benefit of, of real time sensor data? Oh, real time sensor data, you can see what's going on actually as you're doing the mapping and you can sense if you're getting high uh, changes in any temperatures throughout the warehouse i've had instances where people came in to run a pick line and they get a little chilly when they come in in the morning so they have to go over to that thermostat and jack it up just a little bit and i have to go to the end user and say hey i'm seeing some sensors that are registering a little bit higher than uh, normal like from yesterday and he can he asked me where it was located in the warehouse and i'm going to explain it to him he goes oh yeah that's the pick line they just came in they were probably a little chilly so they walked over and capped it up just a little bit. And so obviously you got to put a, a squash to that. So you like to have your thermostats set, you know, set it and forget it if, if it at all possible. Okay, and, and then at the end of the study, why is it important uh, to verify that your sensors are still in the same place that you left them at the very beginning? Yeah, you want to make sure that they, uh, they didn't get nudged by a fork truck, or I think Silva mentioned it earlier, you put it on a pallet or a rollaway cage and it, it ends up down the line somewhere and you don't know where that that location has uh, has gone to. So you just want to make sure that everything that was placed is uh, stays there for the duration of the study. Excellent. Okay, great. Thank you. I think we're time. It's time for our second uh, interactive poll question. So Amy, could you put that one up?
Rob, we have 30% voted so far, so I'm just going to give it another few seconds. Okay. People are still voting, so that's good. Okay, so it looks like 63% have chosen confirming and documenting for compliance. And then we we'll have 29% who uh, use it to create a performance baseline. Okay. okay. So it sounds like a lot of them being used maybe for, uh, for the 29% maybe for more of the commissioning piece of it uh, when they're when they're getting uh, ready to put a monitoring system in. The, the confirming or documenting compliance and regulatory guidelines, that makes sense to me too, um, because I mean, with the regulations out there uh, and the FDA and the inspections and the customer inspections for some of you who might be CMOs, that, that makes perfect sense to me uh, that, uh, that you wanna be in compliance with the regs. Um, any other thoughts from the panel on this? Yeah, I'll just throw that none of those answers were really incorrect. Um, just uh, sort of, you know, each there's there's a million, you know, good reasons and uh, you know out there for for doing it. So it was kind of a question where you had to think about the one that that was most applicable in your case. Right, right. That's good. Makes us think, right? <laughs> All right, so uh, let's let's move on. We'll move on to analyzing results. So by now we've we've done uh, um, creating the plan, we've done uh, executing the plan, and now we're going to actually analyze the results. So again, there's uh, four bullet points here that we're going to go over: uh, results and acceptance criteria, maximum and minimum results, mean kinetic temperature results, and then any sort of pitfalls and experience, and we'll kind of throw that out to the team here once we get down there. Uh, so let's start with uh, results and acceptance criteria and the maximum and minimum uh, mapping results. And Lauren, um, why is it important and how can it play into monitoring your warehouse? Uh, starting with maximum and minimum. <laughs> um, yeah, you want to make sure your warehouse is always running within specification, uh, especially while storing you know, important products in there. Uh, the best way to achieve this is to place your monitoring sensor sensors at the maximum and minimum locations found during the qualification. Uh, this way you can monitor the entire temperature band uh, that you saw during the qualification. Uh, and ideally, uh, your warehouse will remain to uh, operating within that temperature band, uh, but by having one sensor at each end, you would know if it went out. Uh, so this, ideally, you would have two, at least two sensors to do this. Um, and then John Masiello is actually doing a webinar tomorrow at two, I believe at two, uh, on how to place your monitoring sensors. Um, so you can sign up for that as well and get more details on this. Yeah, sounds great. Sounds great. Yeah, we're looking forward to tomorrow's presentation. I'll give a little uh, um, update on that too, I think at the end of the next slide. So that's that's great. Uh, all right, so Mean kinetic temperature, Sylvan. What why, uh, what is mean kinetic temperature used for? I know we see the uh, on the side there. There's the uh, equation for it. Can you give us a little bit more meaning behind it? <laughs> Certainly. Yeah, the the formula there's a little intimidating looking, but uh, it's really it's it functions as a it's a weighted average. Um, and the idea behind mean kinetic temperature is to you're you're trying to basically express the overall effect of temperature fluctuations or excursions that are occurring during that time period. Um, that was, you know, often it's used a lot in stability applications or when you're looking at degradation of material based on, you know, what the change in temperature, what impact it'll have. Um, and it's usually applicable, you know, in, in a storage condition or in a transit condition. So you can take each one of the readings, you know, all, all of the collected data from one particular sensor location, you can derive an, an MKT value uh, for that location. Um, and it will encompass the entire duration of the study and basically, um, you know, show you kind of what the effect of those fluctuations and excursions had. Um, I would say if somebody decides to use the MKT as part of their study, you know, get a data logging system that will do that for you. Uh, I believe most modern ones will but it's not something you're gonna to wanna to have to manually calculate. So if the software will take care of that for you, that's a good thing. 
And um, I would also, you know, mention that if if the mean kinetic temp is used as part of the, you know, if it's evaluated as part of the study and if it's included in the study results, um, it's really important not to ignore the excursions that occurred. If any temperatures, you know, go out of the specified operating range, those really should still be evaluated in the qualification. Um, it might be, you know, convenient or nice to look at the MKT and say, well, you know, that passes, so we're good. But uh, it, it's appropriate to also take a look at any individual excursions that occurred if they exceeded the operating range, either on the low or the high end, just to make sure it's fully understood as to why and what's going on in that in that location. Excellent. Thanks, Sylvan. All right, so up to some pitfalls and some experiences. I'll share one just to start, and then we'll see if any of the team members have uh, have one here. Uh, so I, I'm old school. I went way back to when we used digi strips and V2Ks uh, for uh, for mapping our warehouses. And uh, back in the day, I was working for a company, and we were we were mapping a warehouse. And as you can imagine, we had to string up all the uh, 100 to 200 foot long thermal couples and uh, got those all set up and then uh, operations came through with a forklift and ripped quite a few of them down and actually damaged three of the v2ks so bad experience there we had to go back and we had to remap it all again and uh, definitely a lot more signage the second time around that's that's uh, my old school experience with it anyways any other experiences uh mike uh, or sylvan or lauren that you might might want to share yeah, product too close to the walls. You know, some places have uh, pallet rails, which are very supportive to prevent such a thing. Um, but if, especially on the ground level, it's easy enough to, to push something back against the wall. Not only is that detrimental to the product storage itself, but airflow as well can be constricted uh, along those lines and, and actually height uh, restrictions as well. I know here in Mass, you need to be 18 inches from a fire suppression system. Uh, so if you get a little too high, not only are you out of code as far as the fire suppression system goes. But you again, you can always uh, disrupt your airflow or if it's near a return or uh, the HVAC system vent itself. And those thermostats too, we've had that before. I'll leave those thermostats where they are. <laughs> Don't touch the thermostats. All right, <laughs> sounds good to me. All right, anything, anything else before we move on guys? Yeah, I'll, I'll kind of, I think probably repeat what I said before. Having a, a real-time system is, uh, is, is just potentially uh, life-saving when you're doing this type of work. Uh, if you're trying to get a seasonal mapping done, there's a window of time involved. We're trying to get that mapping done within some time, you know, within uh, very specific time constraints or that facility needs to be online, you're on a schedule. And if you are using a system that where you're flying blind and you're programming it and you have to wait until the study finishes to be able to retrieve the data, and then you find out, you know, a full week later that there was a problem or an issue, or maybe, you know, a door wasn't being kept shut, you know, something that was very easily preventable. You might've had good results otherwise, but you now lost an entire week. Um, I can't stress enough, you know, to use a, a system that gives you real-time data that you can see what's going on so that if there's a problem, you'll know right away and you can address it. Um, for us as a service provider, we can communicate that to our customer right away too. It's just, it's better all around. So that, um, with the availability of those types of systems these days, I don't, you know, I'd say I'd highly encourage that that's used for this type of work. Okay, great. All right, let's uh, let's move on to our second to last slide. Um, so conclusions and recommendations. So again, we've created the plan, executed it, we've analyzed the results. Now we've got to the point of getting that summary report together and providing those conclusions and recommendations to to our customer. So how do we make use of the results and what are some of the operational uh, considerations that are out there, Sylvan? Um, operational considerations. So now you have this data and um, it really, you know, it's showing you a lot, it gives you a lot of visibility as to what's going on in the space. So it's uh, important to really look at now that you have this information, um, are the areas that you're using for material and product storage, are they appropriate? Um, are they being maintained where you want them to be? Are you at the hairy edge of uh, possible failure? You know, will something very small push your temperatures out of uh, the accepted operating range? Um, that's, you know, I think that's an important assessment that, that should be done once that, you know, data has been collected. Making sure that um, we understand 
the, the data, the changes we might see in the data during different periods of activity. Um, you know, we, we map longer so that we see all that activity. What, a, you know, I mentioned before, a door being left open. Um, you know, maybe there's a timer or a buzzer that needs to be placed on a door to make sure that people are reminded to close it because we know that if that door is left open for several minutes, then you're going to have uh, your temperature is going to go out in that part of the in, the, in that part of the warehouse. So those kind of things are important. I think also, you know, we talk monitoring system a lot and we have that as the next, you know, as one of the upcoming items here, but you have that data um, that should help to drive decisions about where monitoring system or monitoring sensors uh, should be placed also. Okay, thank you. Uh, Requalification, when is this needed, Mike? Requal well, actually it's gonna come up to your own understanding of what you really need. Um, Recall could be yearly, like we discussed earlier. It could be three to two to three years. Uh, if you have a problem in that previous mapping, you may want to schedule it uh, a little closer in time. Uh, if you've made corrections to it after a, a, a bad uh, mapping, that way you can uh, attest to your fixture was was able to control whatever you the the problem was. Okay, thank you. Um, monitoring number of locations and sensors lauren yeah uh i touched on this a little bit um earlier um uh, at the absolute minimum you'd want two ideally three sensors uh placed throughout your warehouse uh, at the minimum and maximum locations from the qualification study uh, i think that answers it <laughs> Okay, and, uh, and and there is a presentation tomorrow. We did mention that too, and I do see that there was a question that came up, so we'll, we'll answer that one now. Um, someone asked, uh, how would I go about signing up for placing loggers webinar tomorrow uh, that was mentioned? Uh, so what you want to do is you want to go to HTTPS, basically the PDA org site, uh, and then go to global events calendar, and then event detail. And it's being run out of the PDA uh, Southeast chapter. Uh, and it should be inside of there that says webinar strategic monitoring. Um, John Massiello has given that. It is at 2 o'clock to 3 p.m. I'm sure we could probably send a, a something out to those participants today after this that also would give that address to people too. So that way you don't have to worry about writing down the very long uh, uh, detailed uh, address that's there because there, there's a big address that's there with it. Uh, but yeah, John's given that tomorrow, 2 to 3.30 p.m. And that is with the uh, Southeast. PDA chapter. All right, uh, we're up to our third poll question uh, of the day. So Lisa or Amy, would you please post that? Yes, we're gonna post that right now. <laughs> and again, we'll give everybody a minute or so to, to answer as best you can. See maybe uh, some things that we might need to go over a little bit more if we need to. Okay, we have um, some answers here. It looks like a good number of people are asking um, or would like some more information about whether or not they should be doing validation work in-house or contracting it out. And then we also have some uh, people who are questioning how mapping projects are performed. So they would like a little bit more information on that. Okay, great. Mike, would you take the, the part on how uh, how they're performed? Uh, perform, yeah, we discussed a little bit about that earlier. Um, you're going to pick a, a duration. We're going to come in and place sensors. Uh, again, you know, we, we map the perimeter around this, uh, the, the storage area, um, all three planes, top, middle, and bottom, your, your thermostats, your, your monitoring systems, um, and we'll run it for the duration that, that you're going to need it and build you a report. Um, and that's about it. Okay, and if, if there's uh, more detail, it needs to be added to that for sure. They can reach out, and, and I'll give at the end uh, the the email addresses for myself and for Kevin Neskevich. Uh, if there are some things that uh, that you're looking for in particular, uh, we can uh, try to help you out there too. 
Um, anything else on that particular topic? Okay. Um, the other one was on uh, whether you do it in-house or, or outsource it. Uh, certainly, uh, if you're going to outsource it, uh, we could certainly help you out there. Uh, I think it, for most companies, it probably comes down to cost and what, what it takes to be able to do it, uh, what type of equipment or what equipment you have available to you uh, to be able to, to run these studies. Uh, especially if it gets into a larger warehouse and you're dealing with more sensors. Most people don't have a lot of sensors. The nice part for Massey is that we do have a, a large amount of sensors uh, to be able to map very large uh, warehouses. Um, so there's, there's definitely that um, uh, consideration that's out there and then certainly the cost consideration. Okay. All right, so at this point, I think we're done with the polls. Uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna jump over to questions uh, that are out there, if there are any additional questions, and uh, we'll do our best to answer those here. Um, Rob, I have a question that came in actually through the chat, and mm -hmm. someone is asking, is there a relationship between HVAC performance qualification and warehouse mapping? Yep. Um, there certainly, I believe there certainly is, because uh, that, that gets into uh, one of the major roles for being able to make sure that your temperature is controlled within that space. Uh, so if your HVAC or your air conditioner, or even if you have heaters too, right, each one of those can have an impact as to how the temperature is controlled. Um, anybody have any additional insight into that, Sylvan or Mike or Lauren? Yeah, I, I can jump in on this one. There's Qualifying the HVAC system itself, it's a delivery system. It's basically, you know, it's providing a service for that space. And there's a lot that goes on. It's a relatively complex uh, mechanical system uh, with dampers, with a lot of sensors. Um, there's a lot of, you know, moving parts and pieces, et cetera. Uh, there's there's a, a, a functional uh, characteristics. There's a lot of things that can be qualified. If you want to qualify an air handling unit or that HVAC system, that certainly can be done. Um, that's a decision that's based on how deep you want to go, to be honest. Um, at the end of the day, what's really going to matter the most is that the space is being maintained where it needs to be. Um, and sometimes the approach is just to commission the system that's providing the service to that space to maintain it. But uh, there's certainly, qualification can certainly be done as well. And if you qualify that system, you're you're, you know, you're, you're basically taking a little bit more of a, I'd say a robust approach toward making sure that it does everything to specification as it should. And uh, when your space is gonna be relying on that system to function properly, that's certainly not a bad thing to do. Okay. So Amy or Lisa, any other additional questions that you're getting in? Yes, I have a question that came in. Uh, it's a long question. I'll just read it out. Um, questions, how do you determine the number of probes used to map the storage space? And at what size storage space do the number of probes increase? What frequency of remapping is recommended? Is remapping required only when a change to space is needed? And will annual reevaluation suffice? And is winter mapping needed in a place like Boca Raton, Florida? Also, how many permanent monitoring probes should be installed to continuously monitor a storage space? And what are the major mapping differences for ambient and cold room storage? So there's a lot there. <laughs> um, Maybe we'll take them one at a time. Do you mind reading sure. uh, one and we'll uh, try to knock it off one at a time? <laughs> sure. Um, how, how do you determine the number of probes used to map a storage space? And at which size storage space did the number of probes increase? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Mike, do you want to take that? Or you want me to take it? You take it, Rob. All right. So where we start is uh, certainly when when there's a a smaller space, uh, such as a, like a 10 by 10 or a 10, uh, 10 by 20 or a 20 by 20 room, uh, that would have generally, like Mike was saying earlier, uh, where we would do probe all the corners and probe in the middle. Uh, so we would at least have 15, but definitely one probably next to the thermostat as well. And then if we needed to do anything next to a door or any windows, we would do that as well. So it kind of would have to take into consideration what that room would look like. Certainly as you get bigger than that, then uh, we start adding on more and more probes as you go along. Uh, there's, there's certain guidances out there 
that uh, that have you do them uh, within 30 feet. Some of them have you go a little bit further, and some move them around a little bit, where uh, it's more of a five dice pattern that you're looking at per wall, uh, and then they're moving sensors at the different planes, top, middle, and bottom, uh, throughout to be able to give you a nice, uh, um, um, robust mapping of the system. It also gets into play, I guess, when you look at a lot of the things. Uh, what do you have for HVAC inside of the area? Uh, as we discussed uh, earlier, or air conditioning or heaters inside the area, anything that might also give off heat, say if you have a bunch of uh, a freezer, a freezer farm inside the area, you know, but you're storing product close to it, that gives off heat, you know, lighting, there's a lot of different considerations for it. Okay, part two, what frequency of remap remapping is recommended? Is remapping required only when a change to the space is needed, or will an annual reevaluation suffice? Yeah, I think personally, I think that annual uh, revalidation uh, is probably uh, that that would suffice. It's, it's something that uh, we don't uh, always see when we're dealing with a lot of customers. A lot of them, what they do is they'll have the uh, they'll do the commissioning or the OQ mapping, then they'll do some uh, seasonal mappings. But then after that, as long as they have a very strong and robust uh, monitoring system in place, a lot of times people will actually extend that a little bit further out as long as you're not changing different things within the room, such as, again, you're not changing the HVAC, you're not adding heaters, uh, you know, you're not adding a lot of that type of things that would impact the temperature in the product being stored within that, within that area. Any other uh, comments on that one, guys? Yeah, I, you know, a lot of times a question will come up about, you know, if a component is changed down on, on the HVAC system, you know, do we have to requalify or remap because of that? And the, you know, there aren't really hard rules about stuff like this, but the general, you know, the, when we talk about best practice, the general understanding is that if you're replacing a component with like for like a part, you know, that's the same, functionally equivalent, like, that you don't necessarily have to, you know, revalidate a system because of that. However, um, having worked with large HVAC systems over a long period of time, uh, you can't say that about every part. If a, a compressor or a very large, you know, major component is changed out, that can actually affect the behavior of the system afterwards. So I think it really depends on, you know, what's replaced. And uh, I think always the question that has to be asked is, will this cause potential impact to the product or the, the, the storage conditions that we're trying to maintain. And if the, you know, so it's, it's always a risk-based decision based on the criticality of what's being stored and whether we think we're gonna impact uh, that, that temperature or humidity control. So if that question can't be confidently answered, um, that, that, that there's no impact, um, then some degree of qualification is probably appropriate. Um, but again, you know, that doesn't mean that a, uh, you know, a small part on the system, uh, as long as it's like for light, generally speaking, no, you don't have to revalidate for something like that. And I'll, I'll also mention uh, changes to the space itself. Rob touched on this. Um, we're talking about airflow here. If you decide to add racking into a warehouse, you've just changed the airflow dynamics of that space. You definitely need to remap. There's no question. Um, where I see a bit of a mixed opinion is on whether you need to remap after you remove something. So let's say there was a rack there and you take it out. Uh, there's an argument to be made that, well, if anything, where there's less obstruction, now the airflow would be improved. Um, yes, but without data, you don't really know. And you might have improved air airflow into one area and decreased it from another. So uh, really the best way to answer that if there's a question mark that exists is to collect the data, do the mapping, and then you know for sure. Um, you an absolute definite answer at that point once you've collected the data. So hopefully that helps. Okay, Amy, what was the rest of that? Okay, there's a, um, the other questions regarding how many permanent monitoring probes should be installed to continuously monitor storage space. And then another question relating to that, what are the differences for ambient and cold room storage space mapping? Mike, you want to take that? The ambient storage and cold storage? Sure. Uh, difference in size of the room is going to dictate how many sensors you use. Is that what the question was? How many sensors? Yes. Uh, well, uh, a smaller cold room, I think Rob touched on it, would be you know as little as 16 sensors. Depending on the size, you could increase that. Um, 
again, it's just based on how, how big that cold room would be as opposed to an amb in an ambient space the same way. You could have a giant warehouse or you could have a small 10 by 20 type room, which you can get away with like 16 uh, sensors. And if it's not exposed to the outside, you're really not mapping um, to the outside elements. You know, when we do a warehouse, we'll map the inside. We'll also throw a sensor outside to collect the environment that that warehouse is in. Um, with an internal room, you're not so much guided by that. Uh, if it's a controlled substance type room inside a warehouse, we, we tend to place one out into the ambient uh, area as well when we're mapping something that's, uh, say, a two to eight uh, controlled room. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good point, too, and it is brought up in uh, a lot of the guidance documents as well um that you should have one outside as well uh, measuring the atmosphere during the time that you're uh, you're performing the study so whether it be summer or winter uh, you should be checking and making sure that that uh that it makes sense because people have got to look where too they want to know what what it was outside for those extremes uh when you're mapping um was the other question around monitoring uh on there amy um no no okay sorry yep. okay <laughs> Um, I have another question. The question is, is it possible to use an infrared camera to define the hottest spots in a warehouse? <laughs> I snorted first. He gets a go on this one. <laughs> <laughs> I personally haven't seen that. Uh, I don't know if these guys have uh, with their experience, but I have not seen that. I have not. Uh, I have not either. And again, we talked about the... Um, yeah, accuracy of, of that, of whatever you're using to try to take that measurement. Um, you know, I'd, I'd be concerned about the accuracy uh, of that type of a device, but no, it's not something we've, we've seen used. Okay, another one. Have you ever utilized a non-real-time logger, whereas you had a failure? How did that impact your timetable or project budget? Um, yeah, I mentioned that one earlier. Um, well, with with any type of equipment, there's always a possibility of some failure, and uh, that goes up quite a bit once you start relying on batteries. You have little portable loggers, you have a hundred of them. Um, you know, the chances that a battery might decide to die prematurely on you, even if you replace them all, it exists, that, that can happen. So we try to always design the study with uh, an allowable amount of uh, failure because you really don't want to have to repeat all of that work for the sake of one sensor going bad. And that's why you know you want to make sure you're using a good amount of sensors also, so that you still have a good valid study if you lose uh, uh, you know a small percentage of your sensors. And we typically define that to be around 90%. So we we want to we have to establish a limit there. I'm like, obviously, if we have 100 sensors hanging up and 99 of them decide not to collect data, well, we don't really have a study. <laughs> so. Yeah. We, we established a rule of 90%, so for 100 sensors, you would be allowed to lose 10, um, but we also pay attention to which sensors we lost. If they're in an area where it's going to be critical, we might decide that we still need to re-execute that study. So, um, But yeah, to answer the question, yes, uh, if you don't see the data while it's recording, you don't know that that logger's functioning. And if you know several loggers decided not to turn on and record, or the batteries died or something happened, you don't know until your study's finished and you've lost that time. So it, it is definitely impactful, and it, it kind of leads right into what I said earlier. Use a system where you can see that data. It's not, you can't use that type of system, but you just don't have any knowledge of whether your study completed successfully and whether all the loggers worked until you're done. So, mm -hmm. Or if they're yeah, wrong. I mean, if you, find out, if you find out once you take them all down and read them that they weren't in spec, then you have to rerun the study at that point and you're looking at another week, uh, which is another reason to try to map it earlier in the season than later in the season. Uh, there's something that we didn't touch upon earlier, but later in the season, the temperature is also changing. Um, by the time you're reaching like March, it can, especially in say New England, you're looking at random 70 degree days uh, Fahrenheit. Uh, and that's not really a winter mapping at that point, especially in New England, which is crazy weather. Uh, who knows what's going to happen in March and September? Uh, so for both of those reasons and giving you some extra time to remap if you need to, uh, preferably middle, middle of the season would be best. I'd like to speak to the interval on that, too. You can actually collect it too quick of an interval that could hinder your uh, studies as well. 
they tend to talk over each other. You may miss some data. So that's what we technically, basically will go five, 10 minutes or better as far as a collection rate on a warehouse mapping. Yeah, that's true, right? Because battery, the battery, the battery somehow plays into the amount of uh, amount of data points you will collect. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Yeah, th those are all great points. Amy, do you have another another question? For I us? do have another question. Um, I'm trying to. This, I'll, I'll read it anyway. And if you decided it's already been answered, you don't have to answer it again. But. Um, if I don't have a budget to do summer and the winter mapping in one year, is it okay to do summer one year and winter 18 months later, or should I do both within 12 months? Yeah, so if, if you've already done it, and that's that's what I'm sensing, it sounds like they've already done it once. Uh, if they've done it once and it's 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 more of a RQ type thing, people do them at different intervals. Um, so I know some uh, some different companies that we work with and, and things I've seen in the past where they'll they'll stagger them. Uh, they'll do a summer mapping uh, one year, they'll do a winter the next year, or they'll stagger it out even a little bit further than that, uh, whatever meets their needs. And especially if they have a, a robust monitoring system to go with it that's collecting that continuous data. And some people, uh, I know uh, we mentioned earlier, you know, uh, you could have one, two, three sensors for monitoring that are inside of there, but some people go with a lot more monitoring than, uh, than even that. Uh, they'll do an A-plus uh, type monitoring system that collects uh, data continuously and they'll use that and they can justify being able to move out those requalifications uh, to, to give themselves some more time. And, you know, and hey, time is money, right? And, uh, and that's, that's a big key. Okay, I have one more. Um, what data logger technology do you recommend for a small storage area versus a larger warehouse? I'd like to migrate from thermocouples to wireless data loggers. But are there any pitfalls to doing that? Lauren, you want to take that that one? Yeah, uh, I can actually see this one. Um, yeah, I mean the the benefit to a wired system like TCs is you get that live data. Um, it's never going to be interrupted. Um, the only reason would be if if your TC broke, at which point you just don't have the data anyways. Uh, so that's going to be uninterrupted data. When looking at wireless sensors, there's always the chance of that being interrupted. Um, if you're looking at RF um, materials, ma materials of the wall or temperature conditions, um, like your laptop um, or receiving station can't necessarily work in cold conditions, uh, that's going to affect whether or not you can see the live data. Uh, so at that point, it's a little riskier. Like we were talking about before, if you find out at the end of the study, uh, what was actually going on for those last seven days. Uh, and then we have our new Sense Anywhere sensors, uh, which use uh, Wi-Fi. Uh, those ones are more reliable. Uh, you can see them live uh, from anywhere um, by logging into the cloud. Uh, but obviously, if you lost internet or something, you wouldn't be able to see those sensors for that period of time. So there's a little bit of a risk there. It's not, I don't think it would be enough to uh, not use the wireless sensors, uh, but just something to keep in mind. Yeah, certainly on the, on the Sense Anywhere sensors in particular. Uh, so in, in the, if it was, if you didn't have uh, the wireless connection, it still collects everything. So the moment that snaps back on, everything's there. So that was a good point by, by you, Lauren. Thank you. Amy, do you have another one? I think one? that's all I have. Um, people are asking about um, signing up for the webinar tomorrow, and we will send. We can send that link to everyone. Um, and Rob, did you talked about that a bit? Um, yep, yep. If we could send that, that'd be great. That way, everybody has it. I'd like to find out about that uh, warehouse in Boca Raton. I thought I heard something about that earlier. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that was okay. kind of the, the ones I've mapped have never been in Boca Raton. I don't know why that is. <laughs> Don't get the, the, summer warehouse. the question was, is winter mapping needed in a place like Boca Raton, Florida? <laughs> yeah, uh, we'll, we'll take that job. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, um, it still changes some, right? I mean, you know, a little bit. <laughs> um, yeah, winter uh, Boca Raton, perfect. <laughs> uh, so what I put up here is the last slide, too. So 
This has our address. Uh, it has the phone number for Massey. If you need to call in, you can ask for, for somebody. If you want to talk a little bit more about warehouse mapping, certainly email addresses as myself and uh, Kevin Escouch with the two uh, uh, business development guys on the validation side. And then right down below, it's the, uh, the, uh, the website. So you can reach out to Massey. Uh, we have the white paper that's out there that was mentioned earlier as well. Uh, take a look at that. Uh, might, be, might be helpful to some folks that are out there, and uh, we thank you for, for attending. Great. Thank you, everyone. We're going to shut the webinar down now, but please be aware you will be receiving a link um, to the recording webinar if you'd like to look at it um, at another time or share it with other people in your organization. Thank you, everybody. All right. Take care. Bye. Good job, Mike.